Okay, welcome back to Conformal Invariance and Percolation. Um, let me just remind you of the two little points I threw out for discussion. One was the um, airplane problem. So 100 people are boarding an airplane. The first person sits anywhere they want. They choose one of the 100 seats at random. As the rest of the people board, they try to sit in their assigned seats, but if they're occupied, they choose an unoccupied seat at random. You're the last person to board, person 100, and the question is, what's the chance, what's the probability that you get to sit in your assigned seat? And I bring this up because the um, proof involves a kind of matching argument that um, we'll see in more sophisticated forms when we discuss random walks. Does anybody have a comment on this problem? For example, does anybody know the probability that you'll be able to sit? Yes, Benji. I think it's one half. Yes, how many people think it's one half? <laughs> Give me a hands up in your video. Okay, good. Um, Lewis, do you want to explain why you think it's a half? Right. Um, so, I guess it just matters which which of the two seats, like the first persons or the hundredth persons, get sat in first. Say that again. Um, I mean, so I guess. Wait. So, what were the number? Was it the first? Per I forget. The first person sits capriciously, and then everybody else follows follows their nose. They they choose a seat at random if their seat is occupied. Right, so I guess it'll it'll kind of just kick off a cycle, assuming the first person doesn't choose their own seat. They'll displace someone else, and then the cycle will end, I guess, either if someone chooses the first person's seat or if um, someone sits in the last person's seat. And so as whichever of those happens first, we'll decide. Okay. Um, and it's like equally likely. Okay, that sounds pretty plausible. Does anybody have another explanation they want to offer? Just wag, wag your hand if you're interested in saying something. Benji. Um, so the way I think about it is if the first person sits in a random seat, then up until then, everyone is like, doesn't even notice. And then when that person, when person N whose seat is fold, you can kind of think of that person's seat as seat one in that if they sit in seat one, everything else after that would have been normal too. So uh, you basically it just reduces to the same problem with fewer people. So if we just start from the bottom, if there's two people, it's pretty clearly one half. And if there's a lot of people, um, either the first person sits in their seat and you're good or they sit in the last seat and you're bad, or they sit in a middle seat and it's a smaller problem. So okay. it's a half. Great, so that's a nice inductive proof and it uses a principle we will use in random walks, which is that a random walk from step N on can be thought of as a random walk starting anew from the beginning because the future steps don't in any way depend on or the influence by the previous steps. That's the sort of Markov process. So that's, a, that's a nice proof. I like that. Does anybody have another proof to offer? Yes, CJ. Everybody before the last person treats the seat, seat 100 and seat one symmetrically, so it can't be anything other than a half. Great, okay, I like that proof. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sort of matching proof, uh, and uh, we'll see that kind of argument as well. And uh, the way I like to put that proof is, suppose at the beginning, you just put a piece of tape over seat number 100 and seat number 10, uh, uh, one. People behave the same, because the first person never is looking for their seat, and nobody's looking for your seat either. So the behavior is the same. So you can imagine everybody sits down. At the end, there's one seat left. It has tape on it. And you pull off the tape, <laughs> and it's either 1 or 100. And it's 1 or 100 with equal probability, because if you swap the two seats, everyone's behavior would remain the same. Uh, OK, great. Uh, second problem, what's the average value of sine 
to the 100th power. Anybody have a comment on this problem? The, the challenge was actually to try to figure this out in your head. Um, you don't have to get it exactly right, though. Yes, Catherine? Oh, yeah, I think it was cosine. So that's what I thought about. Yeah, sure. That's fine. It um, turns out they're the same. OK, so I think it's between like a 12th, like cosine to the 100 is between like a 12th and a 13th. That's excellent. And do you want to say why? Yeah, so if you basically like you tailor expand cosine to like second order, then you just have like one minus x squared over two to the n. Um, and then you can use Stirling's approximation. So this is basically the same as exponential of minus x squared over uh, exponential minus x squared times n over two, which is like the density for a Gaussian with variance one over n. So then you can estimate the integral of cosine to the n by the integral of a Gauss of a Gaussian without its normalizing term. So you're just getting the normalizing term, and then you're multiplied by pi. So you're just estimating like a square root of something times pi. Excellent. So that's that's the perfect introduction to where I want to start today. So thanks. That's a great solution, and uh, I'm going to explain that solution uh, just a little bit more slowly. Uh, to start our lecture. And we will then use that solution um, frequently, but it, it's, it's uh, a beautiful explanation of why the Gaussian distribution is so universal. Now, there's many explanations of, of why that's true. One is that the Fourier transform of the Gaussian distribution is again a Gaussian distribution. Another is that a Gaussian distribution satisfies a differential equation, x squared times f, plus f double prime equals zero. Um, there's, there's lots of explanations, um, but this one is, comes from what's called the method of stationary phase. And the statement is roughly that if you take any function um, that has a local maximum with a non-degenerate critical point, meaning the second derivative is negative, and you raise it to a very high power, the shape of the graph, no matter how it started, looks when you raise it to a high power like a Gaussian. So let's, let's discuss this Gaussian distribution, which is of course ubiquitous in probability theory, not just in calculus grading. So the first thing is to consider the function e to the minus x squared over two. And the hardest thing, for me at least, when it comes to the Gaussian distribution is Taking this function, which is normalized so that at the origin it's one, uh, and we'll see why the two is there in a moment, and, uh, and remembering what its integral is from minus infinity to infinity. So I'd like to say this uh, determines a random variable by saying how it's distributed, but um, the integral is not one. So the integral of this function well, most people know this by memory, but I always have to figure it out. Um, it turns out to be the square root of two pi. And let me just remind you how you prove that. The slickest way is to consider the square of the integral. And then that you can think of as an integral over x and y of e to the minus x squared plus y squared, dx dy uh, over two. And then you uh, write this in terms of polar coordinates. This only depends on uh, the radius r, which is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So when you integrate in polar coordinates, a 2 pi comes out, and then you have the integral over r goes from 0 to infinity of e to the minus r squared over 2. And then dx dy becomes r dr, dr dr. And that's why it's nice to have this r, this r, this over two here. So um, this quantity r is the derivative of r squared over two. So uh, you can you can see that this quantity here is nothing more than the uh, d of minus e to the minus r squared over two. And so when you evaluate that from zero to infinity, you just get one. So this is two pi. Okay. So the the Gaussian distribution, G1, is G1 
given by this function, one over the square root of two, two pi, I can make the total integral one e to the minus x squared over two. And as usual, a function determines a random variable. This determines a random variable that I'll call x1 by the rule that the probability that x1 is in an interval from a to b is given by the integral from a to b of uh, g1 of x uh, dx. <clears throat> and so, for example, the expected value of x1 is just the integral of x g1 of x dx. So we wait. This is sort of telling you what's the what's the probability that x lands in this interval. If it does, its value is given by x. And so this is a weighted sum of the values of x according to the probability that a given value is assumed. And of course, this is equal to zero because it's an odd function. On the other hand, the expected value of x1 squared, which is the variance of x1, it's also its, its uh, uh, standard deviation squared is the integral of x squared g1 of x dx. And you can check that this is equal to 1. That's another reason why we normalize the Gaussian with this x squared over 2 on the top. So we want uh, to be able to read off the standard deviation from the Gaussian distribution. And in general, you have Gaussians that are wider or narrower. Uh, just by rescaling the x parameter, that doesn't change the expectation, but it changes the variance. And so if I let g um, sigma be 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi uh, times um, e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared, uh, all I've done is I've made a change of variable in, in replacing x by x over sigma, and then normalizing the dx it also changes by a factor of 1 over sigma. So this is still a probability measure, but now it's a standard deviation is, uh, is um, the, the standard deviation of x rho, the corresponding random variable, is equal to rho. Okay, and then finally, one of the main properties of the Gaussian distribution is stationarity. That means if you take two independent Gaussian random variables and take their sum, then you get another Gaussian random variable. And we know how the standard deviation behaves when you take the sum. So if you take a random variable uh, sigma, which has mean zero and is Gaussian distributed with standard deviation sigma, and then you add an independent, I'll call it y delta. So these are independent Gaussian variables. Then the result will be a new Gaussian random variable with the standard deviation, the square root of sigma squared plus delta squared. Okay, so that's a little background on the Gaussian distribution. Um, so now let's talk about how the Gaussian uh, arises in an analytic way in the solution to the problem um, that Catherine just sketched. So I'm going to erase this, but the Gaussian will magically reappear. So here's the setup. Suppose we have a smooth function f defined on a compact interval, positive values less than or equal to one satisfies uh, f double prime at zero is a, which is less than zero. Uh, f of zero equals one. And f of x is strictly less than one when x is not zero. So the picture is, you have some function on the interval from minus b to b. The maximum is achieved only at the origin. So it goes something like this. And it has a non-degenerate critical point. So it looks like a parabola, an inverted parabola near, um, near the top. 
And now we want to compute the, um, we want to understand what a high power of that looks like. And so secretly in the back of our mind, we're thinking of cosine, but for, let's do the general case. <clears throat> so then what does f of x to the n look like? Well, first, when we raise f to a very high power, away from the origin, f is bounded strictly away from one. It's bounded by y minus epsilon for some universal epsilon. So when we take f to a very high power, it tends to zero uniformly away from the points minus b and b. It tends to zero very rapidly. And so the function looks something like this. And it's only where f is bigger than one minus epsilon that it's gonna have any significant height, but it's still gonna be one at the origin, but it's gonna be very small everywhere else. So if we want to compute, say, its integral, the main thing is to know, what does f look like in this transition region where it's going between the value of one and something very small? So, well, let's, let's approximate x then, then with f of x with x near zero. So by Taylor's theorem, f looks like one minus, here's its second derivative coming in, ax squared over two, and then some higher order terms. But we'll be interested in this transition region, which is a very tiny neighborhood of zero. So these very, these higher order terms are almost negligible compared to this term. And then we're gonna take this and raise it to the nth power. So let's just pretend that what we have is exactly one minus ax squared over two because it's very close to that when x is, is near the origin. <clears throat> now remember that one minus y over n to the n converges to e to the minus y as n goes to infinity. And the convergence is, uh, is uniform if, um, if y is in a suitable range. Let's not worry too much about all the epsilons and deltas. Let's just see formally what happens here. So we can write, we can relate this equation to this equation by putting an n in here. So we'll put an n in the top, and then we'll put a 2n on the bottom. So that's the same expression. But now it looks like this, with y being given by um, na x squared uh, over 2. So we expect that this is approximately equal to e to the um, minus uh, n a x squared over two. And let's put this in a slightly more familiar form. This is almost a Gaussian except it's equal to one at the origin. And I have it normalized so its integral is equal to zero. Uh, but this we could write as e to the minus x squared over two sigma squared. So sigma plays the role of the standard deviation here. And what is sigma? Uh, so I have to, the two can stay, but I have to get rid of this stuff here. So sigma is, um, is uh, one over the square root of n times a. Okay. So that's the, this, this we can take as, in some sense, a theorem, I haven't written all the qualifiers and the error terms and et cetera, but the theorem is basically that if you take a function of this type and raise it to a high power, you get something uh, that looks like a Gaussian and uh, it has a standard deviation, which is like one over the square root of n, um, where n is the power you're taking. And then the, the second derivative also intervenes in this uh, to get the exact uh, picture of what the standard deviation is. So in other words, when you look at f of x to the n, and you want to know where is this region where f looks reasonably large, where it's between, say, one third and one, well, that region has width about one over the square root of a n. So interestingly, although f tends to zero exponentially fast, away from the origin, 
there's a region that's that's governed whose width is governed by by the power law of one over square root of n, and that's where all the action is taking place. Okay, so let's use this to what is now stated theorem, which is literally true and can be justified by this calculation. Namely, I'm going to determine what the integral is of f. And the answer is that the integral from minus b to b of f of x to the n dx is asymptotic to what the integral of this guy would be, which is one over uh, sigma n times uh, the square uh, times, uh, sorry, the sigma n goes outside. It's sigma n times the square root of two pi. Right, the width of the Gaussian is uh, proportional to the area underneath the curve. And if the standard deviation were one, it would be square root of two pi, as we just saw. And so this is uh, the square root of two pi uh, over, um, over n times a. And asymptotic means the ratio between the two terms, the right and left hand side, tends to one. So it tells us how this integral tends to zero. It tends to zero like one over the square root of n. Okay, so let's do as an example, the case um, where f of x is the cosine of x, which is one minus x squared over two plus high order terms. So a is equal to one. And actually let's, let's look at the average of this function. So, um, so let's do one over pi times the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of cosine nx dx. Now I should say that the average of an odd power of cosine is of course zero. We'll be interested in the case where n is even. So when n is even, then cosine to the nx is periodic with period pi. So this can be thought of as the average value of cosine of nx over the whole real line. You can average it over uh, one, one uh, period of the function. Um, and so what does this asymptotic to? Well, we get a one over pi, and then we have uh, this factor, square root of two pi over n, a is equal to one. And we put the pi inside and we get the square root of two over uh, pi times n. Okay, so if you can get this factor of square root of two pi uh, in your head, then it's easy to, to figure out by pure thought, even without paper, what you expect this, um, this asymptotic behavior to be. So what, this should be a good approximation to the average value of cosine or sine. And now let's try the value n is equal to 100. So for n is equal to 100, uh, we have to calculate one over the square root of pi times 50. And the way I like to do this is to say this is approximately one over the square root of three, pi is equal to three, and uh, 50 is equal to 49, so it's square root of seven. And the square root of three is 1.7, and uh, seven times 1.7 is uh, Seven times seven is 49, one over 11.9. So it's basically one twelfth, which is 0 0.08333, et cetera. And in fact, the actual value is 0 0.79 something. Um, uh, so the, the point is not so much to be able to get this approximate value in your head, although it's pretty interesting that you can do that without having to integrate. Um, but this general principle that the Gaussian distribution just emerges automatically when you take a high power of a function. Now, let me just say a word about a theorem we're not going to prove in this class, but which is, of course, of great importance in probability theory, which is the, which is the central limit theorem. So, um, 
So suppose we have a random variable uh, x, or rather x1, x2, x3, etc. These are random variables. Let's say that the expectation value of xi is equal to zero, and the expectation value of xi squared is equal to one. And then we let, uh, these are independent random variables with the same distribution, like independent coin flips, for example. And we form the sum Sn, which is x1 plus xn, and then we average it, we divide by n. Then the central limit theorem tells us that Sn is distributed like uh, g1 of x for n large. In other words, of course, the mean of this of this sum is is equal to zero. Its expected value is zero, um, but the distribution around zero is asymptotically like a Gaussian, even though the distribution of the original variables might not be. These are not required to be Gaussians. These might be coin flips. But what's the idea of the proof? The idea of the proof is to compute the Fourier transform or the characteristic function of x1 up to xn. So, so note, and this is the main idea in one of the approaches to the proof, is that the expected value of e to the i theta times x1 plus, plus xn uh, is equal to, since these are identically distributed, it's equal to a single function, f of theta raised to the nth power. And this function f of theta is what you get for any individual one of these things. It's the expect value e to the i theta x1. And this function is, of course, bounded by one because it's the expected value of a number on the circle. So this is less than or equal to one. And in fact, it's equal to one only when theta is equal to zero. So uh, in that case, you're taking the expected value of the constant function one. And so we can apply this analysis to this, to study this function. And, um, and you can see the key is going to be to understand the second derivative. But the second derivative turns out to come from the variance of the function, of, of this, this, the function that we, the um, random variable that we started with. So knowing that x1 has variance one translates into knowing that this, that the um, power series for f begins with one minus x squared over two. And that's why the Gaussian distribution emerges when we take large averages of independent random variables. Okay, now we're gonna use this knowledge to study random walks. So this was just a preliminary of interest in its own right, but um, it's to save us time when we come to establishing some factors about random walks, we see that we'll see that they emerge from these general principles that we've just elucidated. So let's now discuss random walks on the integer lattice CD. So let's start with D is equal to one. And I want to define a random variable, C, which is equal to plus or minus one with equal probability. And then I want to use this as my basic generator of my random walk. So my random walk will start at a point, say zero, and then it will move either plus one or minus one with equal probability. And then it will move again, plus one or minus one with equal probability. And then again, plus one or minus one with equal probability. And the key is that each step should be independent of the previous ones. So we let C1, 
C2, etc. B independent random variables with the same distribution as C. A probable list would just say take an infinite sequence of copies of C independent of one another. And then we define the random walk on Z starting at x equals zero by the sequence x of n equals the sum from one to n of c sub i. So this is itself a random variable. Um, similarly, if we want to do rd, uh, so for, for, for d bigger than one, we define c to be equal to plus or minus ei, i goes from one to d, where the ei is a basis for z. So zd is z e one plus c e two. This is just the standard basis for c e d. And um, so in R2, for example, you start at the origin and there's four directions you can move. So you move in each of these directions with equal probability. So each with probability one over 2D instead of one half, as in the case of, of uh, dimension one. And then we define Xn by exactly the same equation. We take copies of these steps, which now go in four possible directions. And we take our random walk by following a sequence of steps chosen in that way. And, and, and finally, we can, we can also start at uh, x equals, at x naught equals x, rather than x naught equals zero. And then, of course, we define xn to be x, x plus the sum from one to n of ci. And when necessary, I'll introduce some notation that records the fact that we're implicitly starting our random walks at a given lattice point. Okay, so those are the definitions. And the first and most basic and most important theorem about random walks is that they're slow. They don't get away from the origin very rapidly. So the first theorem is, the expected value of xn squared for a random walk of length n starting at the origin is equal to not n, not n which is the number of, uh, not n squared, which it would be the square of the number of steps, but just n. And let me just say for notation, of course, when, when d is equal to one, then this is just an integer, and so we can take it square. Um, but for d greater than one, what I mean by xn squared is the dot product of xn with itself. So, so in d dimensions, this is actually a vector with d components. So it's x1 of n squared plus x2 of n squared plus up to xd of n squared. Okay, so uh, so the the heuristic um, statement behind this is that the way to think of this is that the norm of xn uh, is tends to be around the square root of n. After n steps, you're not making much progress away from the origin. After 100 steps, you're only at distance about 10 most of the time. Okay, the proof is very easy. Uh, so the proof is just to recall that if you have two random variables that are independent, like ci, ci and cj, when i is not equal to j, then the expectation of their product is the product of their expectations. And um, so I'll do the case first, I'll do the case D is equal to one where these are actual numbers. And so this, uh, this product makes sense. And then of course this is zero because each of the vectors is, um, is uh, um, because each of these 
each of these individual steps has mean zero. You go in different directions with equal probability. Uh, in, 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 dimension, in dimension bigger than one, the same idea shows that the expected value of ci dot cj is equal to zero. For example, cj has the same distribution as minus cj. So this must be the same as the, as the expected value of ci times minus cj. And so, of course, it has to vanish. Okay, so what's the point of that? It's just that if we look at what xn squared is, it's just the expected value of xn squared is the expected value of um, the sum of the ci dot the sum of the cj, where the indices go from one to n. So we get a bunch of dot products, but all of the cross terms vanish because of this observation. So we're left with the expected value of the sum over i goes from one to n of ci dot ci. And of course, each step has length one. So these numbers are all one, and this is exactly equal to that. OK, so that gives you an idea of the width of the distribution of the random walk. Now, of course, there's a problem. There is a chance that your random walker is very determined and he or she happens to take n steps all in the same direction. So they could get distance n from the origin in n steps, but the probability of that is two to the minus n because there's only one walk which does that. So uh, um, let me just for orientation mention the relationship to Pascal's triangle. So you can think of Pascal's triangle, let's just quickly write it down, as not a computation of binomial coefficients, although it is, and that connection will be uh, very important to us, but a record of the number of random paths starting at the origin, which is here zero, to a given location on, on the integers. So think of this as position minus one, this is position plus one, plus two, plus three, et cetera. Then the number of paths of length zero starting at the origin is one. Then there's one path which goes to minus one, and there's one path which goes to plus one. Then once you're at one, you can either go to, to, to minus two, at minus one, you can go to minus two, or you can go back to the origin. And you can also go back to the origin this way. So there's two paths that return to the origin. And then there's three paths. With, uh, so this is the distribution of x1, this is the distribution of x2, this is the distribution of x3, and so on. And so Pascal's triangle is just counting for you the number of paths from the origin to a given position on the integers. And so in fact, there's a nice formula for the probability that the, um, that, that the, at the end step of your random walk, you're in a given position. And it's nice to think of a position in the following way. When you say, I got to say position, Let's, let's go down here to say, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's go down here to five, and you might be at position zero, one, two, three. So to get to position three in five steps, you have to have taken, um, let's see, is that actually five to position three? So, uh, right, so you have to have taken four steps in the positive direction and one step in the negative direction. Now, I'm not saying when you took them, but if in five steps you arrive at position three, you did so by going forward four times and backwards once. So it's always nice to decompose the position you arrive at as a sum, uh, sorry, this should be P minus Q, of the number of positive steps you took minus the number of negative steps you took. 
And here k plus q has to be equal to n. So the probably, probability that x of n is equal to p plus q, p minus q rather, where p plus q is equal to n, is uh, just given by uh, the number of possible walks. So we have to divide by that. That's two to the minus n. And then we've taken p, p of, our, of our n steps were positive. So we have to choose from our n steps, p of them to be positive and the remaining ones to be negative. So that explains the connection between binomial coefficients and the number of paths and the probability that you arrive at a given location um, after n steps. So let me just quickly share uh, a demonstration of what happens after 20 steps. So here is a quick Mathematica run <laughs> where I've actually, I've drawn a bar graph telling um, the probability of uh, the number, the probability of arriving at a given location between minus 20 and 20 uh, at, and after 20 steps of the random walk. And as everyone knows, the, the binomial coefficients look more and more like a bell curve. And in fact, that's the content of the central limit theorem that a random walk on the real line, content in this case, that the random walk on the real line is distributed roughly like a Gaussian. And what is the width of that Gaussian? It's exactly the square root of n because the square root of n is the standard deviation of the variable x of n, the random variable that tells you what your position is. Okay. So now let's do something a little more interesting than just letting our random walk go in wherever it wants to. I want to study the following question. What is the probability that after n steps, the random walk has returned to the origin? So what is the probability that x of n is equal to zero? Well, there's one case where you can answer this very rapidly in any number of dimensions. What is the probability that x of 99 is equal to zero. Who knows? Zero. It's zero. zero. <laughs> so you might say after many steps, the random walk is just, it could be anywhere. It's kind of smoothly distributed on the integers. Not quite. The parity of the point you're at changes with every step. On the, if you start at zero, then at step n, you're at a location which is equal to n mod two. So actually there's only half of the integers that you can stand on. And the same thing is true in all dimensions. The sum of the coordinates uh, of your location, its value mod two alternates, alternates between zero and one. That's a reflection of the fact that the adjacency graph on ZP is bipartite. So this is a minor nuance that the, 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 the random walk doesn't treat at step n, all the points equally because it can only reach half of them. Um, so in any case, the right question here then is if you take an even number of steps, what's the probability that you return to zero? Because an odd number of steps is not going to work. And what we're going to show is that in ZD, the probability that xn is equal to zero is asymptotic to a constant that depends on d times n to the minus uh, d over two. Actually, we're, this is true. We're gonna prove something slightly weaker. Now there's many reasons that, it, that first returns, that returns to the origin are of interest to us. One of them is the following basic property of a random walk. You can ask, does the random walk return infinitely off into zero. Now, if the random walk returns infinitely off into zero, then in fact, with probability one, it visits every single point in the integer lattice infinitely often. The reason is 
If the walk comes back to zero and you pick some other position, say we're in Z2 and the position is three, five, every time you hit zero, there's a positive probability of hitting the point three, five. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you do come back to zero again so at some later time and you get another chance. And each of those events is independent and they each have a definite probability. So by Burrell Cantelli, the probability that one of them eventually happens is one. So if you come back to zero infinitely often, you come back to every point infinitely often. So we say the, a, a random walk x of n is recurrent. Well, let's let me put it this way. We say the random walk on ZD is recurrent if the following three equivalent conditions hold. Um, uh, Xn equals zero for infinitely many n. Almost sure. Now, of course, there exists a random walk which never returns to zero. You might just happen to flip heads every single time you, you, you flip a coin and then you walk straight off to infinity, but that's a probability zero event. So what this, the first statement means that with probability one, the random walk returns to zero infinitely often. And then the second statement, which I just mentioned, is that uh, for any, y in cd the probability that xn is equal to y uh, infinitely often is equal to one and now there's a, an equivalent statement which is not obviously the same as the rest but which will allow us to apply this theorem to determine when we have recurrence so the third statement is that the sum of the probability that xn equals zero summed over n is equal to infinity. That means that the expected number of visits to the origin is, uh, is infinite. And um, let me see, was there one more thing I wanted to say? Oh yes, and the, and the final statement is that um, well, let me say, uh, let me say it this way, it's not true that Xn goes to infinity almost surely. Xn going to infinity almost surely means that Xn in the norm of Xn goes to infinity with probability one as n goes to infinity. So what this is really saying is recurrence is a very strong dichotomy. Either you have this good recurrence or with probability one, every point diverges to infinity. You can't have recurrence fail, say, 50% of the time. You can't have that the, the, the probability that Xn returns to the origin infinitely often is a half. Why not? It's a tail event. This is a tail event. That's right. So this is the equivalence with, uh, with this assertion is and the fact that all of these have well, I haven't said that yet. So in fact, all of these events have probability zero or one. So these are all tail events and their probability is equal to zero or one by Kolmogorov's theorem. But we're not gonna actually need Kolmogorov's theorem uh, to prove the equivalence of these notions. Uh, but before we show their equivalent, let me just say what the corollary is. Um, so let's look at criterion three. 
So when D is equal to one, what's the probability that Xn is equal to zero? What's the sum of these probabilities? Well, let me, know, let me just note the fact that if you count the number of times Xn is equal to zero, what you're actually counting is the number of times the random walk visits uh, zero. So this is the expected value of the number of times Xn visits the location zero. And for, um, in the case of dimension one, this is asymptotic as we've seen to some constant depending on one times the sum of one over square root of n. Well, the sum of one over square root of n diverges, so this is infinite. And for d equals two, it's asymptotic to the sum c2, one over n, and that still diverges. But for d greater than or equal to three, we get, for d equals three, we get the sum of n to the three halves, which is finite. Then the sum of one over n squared, which is finite, and so on. And so a corollary of the, of the theorem is that the random walk is recurrent when d equals one or two. Otherwise, xn goes to infinity with probability one. Okay. Um, so that's a that's a beautiful transition that happens uh, between dimensions one and two and dimension three or more. And by the way, since we're at heart complex analysts, we'll be mostly interested in the case of dimension two. So we'll be interested in the case where random walks are recurrent. And I'm gonna develop the theory to the extent it fluidly works in arbitrary dimension, but in the back of my mind, I'm gonna be heading towards results in dimension two, uh, where we will see that all sorts of structures become conformally invariant in the limit. Okay, so let me, to, to prove the equivalence of these assertions, let me introduce something that's not a tail event. There's a nice number you can compute R of n is the probability that xn equals zero for some n. Of course, x starts at the origin. So the probability that xn equals zero for some n greater than or equal to one. Now, by the way, after you've taken your first step, you have a reasonable probability of just reversing it, in which case you've returned to the origin. So this is certainly all, always a positive number. It's greater than or equal to one over two D. Um, now this, but I claim this number is actually very closely related to this number, which is the number of times that you return to the origin. So let's think of it this way. You start at zero, and now with probability one minus R, you never return. And then with probability R, you return to zero. Now, once you've returned to zero, you can start again. You can think of that as starting a whole new random walk. And then you have probability one minus R of never returning, but you have a probability of R of returning twice. So to return twice, you have to luckily return once and then return once again. Those are independent events. So the probability of returning twice is R squared and so on. So the expected number of times Xn visits zero, let's include the initial visit at time zero, because I did take the sum from n is zero to infinity, is just one plus R plus R squared and so on. So this is the probability you visit exactly zero times. This is the probability you visit exactly once, exactly twice, and so on. And this is one over one minus R. 
Ah, so what we see is there's two possibilities. If R, the probability that you that you return to zero for some n, if R is equal to one, then this is equal to infinity. And otherwise it's finite. But I claim that returning to, to, to zero infinitely often is equivalent to R being equal to one. So certainly if R is, if, if you return to zero infinitely often, then with probability one, you return once. And so R is equal to one. But what if R is equal to one? Then you know that certainly you return once. But now you start afresh. And you also return once because you have probability of one of the subsequent random walk returning to zero. Then you start again. You again have probability one. So if you have probability one of visiting the or of returning to the origin even once, then you have probability one of returning infinitely many times. And since this number is the same as this number, we get that uh, all of these gadgets are equivalent to divergence of the sum of the probability that you return to zero. Okay, so that's the that's how the criterion for um, uh, that's how the criterion for uh, recurrence uh, can be reduced to estimating this quantity, the probability that you return to zero at time n. Okay, so now let's um, do a computation. So. Uh, let's prove this theorem. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do the analysis uh, for dimension one and then dimension two and then general dimensions. So dimension one. So I'm gonna let RD of n be the number of paths x0 equals 0 up to xn through adjacent vertices with xn equals 0. Now we've seen that this is equal to 0 when n is odd. So this equals 0 when n is odd. Um, but uh, when n is even, it's equal to RD of 2n is equal to 2n choose 2, two choose n. In other words, it's 2n factorial over n factorial squared. Okay, in other words, this it's the central entry in Pascal's triangle. And the reason is that to return to the origin in two n steps, you just have to take n steps in the positive direction and n steps in the negative direction. And once you know what the positive steps are, the negative steps are just the rest. So you have to choose from your two n steps, n of them to be positive, and that gives this count. And so then, of course, our little d of two n, which is the probability that um, that x of n is equal to zero, or x of 2n is equal to zero, uh, is just equal to 2 to the minus 2n times 2n choose n. So we have an exact formula for the probability. Now there's another neat way to write this probability. Namely, it is given by 1 over 2 pi times the integral from minus pi to pi of cosine 2n theta d theta. In other words, it's actually the average value of an even value of, value of cosine. And, and we computed this at the very beginning of class. What is this asymptotic to? It's asymptotic to um, 
the square root of uh, two over pi times one times n, but n here is two n. And so we get one over the square root of pi times n. So once I justified the statement that rd is equal to this integral, then we'll know that in fact, the asymptotic value that I've given here is correct. So it goes like one over the square root of n, that's the main point. And, um, and then the, the constant in, in front, which is just sort of the icing on the cake, turns out to be one over the square root of pi. Okay, now first, why is this the right answer? Why is this theorem what you would expect in dimension D? The reason is very simple. You see, in ZD, we start a random walk at the origin, and then we come to XN, and XN is some point in the ball of radius square root of N. Now you've taken N steps, and you're only move distance at, uh, uh, square root of n from the origin. So you might guess heuristically that you have about an equal probability of visiting any of the points in this ball. Now, how many points are there in this ball? There's the, the radius of the ball is square root of n. So the number of points is the square root of n to the d. And one of those points is the origin. So the probability that you visit, that you're at the origin at time n, which is this probability here, or at time 2n, should be like the reciprocal of the number of points in the ball. So the number of points is asymptotic to a constant times, um, times uh, 1 over the square root of n raised to the dth power, which is 1 over n to the d over 2. And so, among those points, if they're roughly equally likely to be hit by xn, then the probability you hit zero should be asymptotic to this number here, or at least comparable to it. So that's why the heuristic is right. Now, this calculation not only shows the heuristic is right, but it gives you the exact constant. So where does it come from? Well, there's two ways to explain this formula. And one of them I find really beautiful and simple it's, it's a, how do we figure out what the central entry is in Pascal's triangle? So what we do is, um, so let me call this formula, this equality here, star. So the proof of star is the following. We consider Z plus Z inverse, over two raised to the nth power. This will give us a power series in z to the n, in, in z to the k, and k will go from minus n to n because we started out with first power. So the highest powers of z we can get are plus or minus n. Now, what is the coefficient that appears in front of k. Well, it's exactly the probability that a random walk in n steps starting at the origin ends at k. <laughs> right, because how do you, when you expand out this product, let's forget about the two for the moment, you have a bunch of products of z plus z to the plus one and z to the minus one. And it went in each term in this big product, you have to choose either plus or minus one. And there's n terms. So the coefficient of z to the p plus q is the number of ways among these n terms to choose p of them to be positive and q of them to be negative. Sorry, p, but p minus q. p of them to be the plus term and q of them to be the minus term. And, and that's nothing more than than the number of paths that start at the origin and end at the point p minus q. And, uh, and so um, that if we include the two ends, then we get a two to the minus n in front of everything. We get exactly the probability that a random walk uh, 
of length like n ends at the point k. So here, pn of k, the probability in one dimension that xn is equal to k. Okay, so what we see is that the return to the origin is the coefficient of p of zero. So the constant term is equal to the probability that after n steps, we're at zero, which is what I'm calling uh, r sub n of zero, the probability of a return to zero after n steps. Now, how do you compute the constant term? You just take the average of this function because the average of the function z to the k over the circle vanishes unless k is equal to zero. So this is just the average over S1 of z plus z inverse over two to the nth power. And now you just set z equal to e to the i theta to do your calculation. And lo and behold, this function becomes cosine theta to the nth power. And so we're interested in the case of even length walk. So we replace n by 2n, and then we get this interval. So that's an explanation of why this interval computes this function. A somewhat different explanation of exactly the same thing is just that the Fourier transform applied to Xn gives us a high power of the Fourier transform applied to C. So remember C was plus or minus one with equal probability. So the expected value of E to the I C is nothing at times theta is nothing more than the cosine of theta. And so the, and that's the Fourier transform of C or rather the characteristic function of C, almost the Fourier transform. And then the, uh, the Fourier transform of Xn of theta is just the Fourier transform of C, or the characteristic function of C1 up, plus up, up to Cn of theta. And since these are independent, it's just f of C of theta to the n, which is the cosine to, uh, to the n of theta. And then finally, if we want to go backwards from the Fourier transform to the distribution of x of n, we, we apply the inverse Fourier transform. So the probability that xn is uh, equal to k is, uh, is exactly the, um, the integral 1 over 2 pi. And then we take the integral of e to the i k theta times um, f of xn to the n, which is cosine to the n theta d theta. So indeed, we have an exact formula for this probability here. And then we set k equals 0. And, uh, and we get the integral formula uh, for the probability of a return at time n. OK, so this is a quantity that comes up over and over again. It has both an exact value, which is a binomial coefficient, and an asymptotic value, which is uh, 1 over the square root of pi n. So that proves our theorem in the case of dimension 1. Now we're going to do the case of dimension 2. And dimension two is really terrific. Um, because it turns out to be so easy. <laughs> so for dimension two, there's the following beautiful idea. Let's suppose I think of my random walk as having two coordinates, a n and b n. And remember, what I do is I choose to move horizontally or vertically at each, at each moment. And then I decide to move plus one or minus one. So I can think of my choice as being composed of two choices. First, I decide if I'm going to change A or B. And then I decide whether I'm going to add one or subtract one. Now, what that means is that AN is not a random walk in one dimension, because AN can be stationary. 
If I decide to move in the vertical direction, AN doesn't change. So you might say, oh, that's unfortunate. There's no simple relationship between random walks in dimension two and random walks in dimension one, but that's wrong. There is a relationship, but it's just not this simple one. If you take AN plus BN and AN minus BN, these are both standard random walks on Z. Because remember, at every stage, you have to add or subtract one from ex to exactly one of these two quantities. Not only that, but these are two independent random walks. You make four choices about which direction to move. And two of the, those choices, the, the value of an plus bn is the same for these two choices and as for these two choices. The value of an minus bn is the same for these two choices and these two choices. So these are independent standard random ones. Okay, so there's these two different standard random walks, which can be extracted from a random walk on C2. Now, when do you return to the origin? You return to the origin exactly when A and N and B and N are both zero. But these are independent events. So the probability that Xn equals zero is the probability that A n equals B n equals zero which is just the probability that an equals zero squared. And that's the same as the probability in dimension one that we have a return to the origin squared. So in other words, this quantity, which is return to the origin in dimension two at step n, is the same as return to the origin in dimension one squared. And so of course, again, this can only occur for even values. And we find that R2, of 2n is uh, is asymptotic to the square of what we would get in one dimension. So we get 1 over pi n. OK, so that's a very simple proof of what happens in dimension 2. And it even gives us the asymptotic constant. And in much the same way, you can also count the number of paths which return to the origin in that amount of time. So to specify a path of length n that returns to the origin is the same as to specify two one-dimensional paths of length n that return to the origin. So R1, R2 of n, which is the number of paths with x of n equals zero, is just uh, R1 of n squared. OK. So finally, what happens for dimension D greater than or equal to three? It turns out that probably the best way to analyze what goes on in higher dimensions uses the characteristic function. So just to sum up, and I'll elaborate the higher dimensional situation in more detail next time, to analyze dimension three, we use the fact that uh, the, the probability uh, in two n steps of returning to, to um, uh, of returning to zero in two n steps in dimension D, R D two n, is again, it's given by an average of the some sort of Fourier transform. So there's a two pi to the minus D, S1 of D. And then here we take the district, the characteristic function of our simple step C, we raise it to the 2nth power and integrate it with respect to theta. Okay, so now we have to know what F of C is. So remember, C was equal to plus or minus PI, each with probability uh, 1 over 2 to the D. So it turns out that FC of theta is, it involves cosines, but it's one over um, D times the sum of cosine of theta I. 
So here I goes from one to D. So remember theta now is ranging in the torus. So it has D different coordinates, each of which, which ranges in the circle of length two pi. Um, and that's just because you get a cosine of theta one for the steps in the, in the direction one and minus one on the, on the first axis in the variable. And then you get a number of cosine for the next one and so on. So remember cosine involves two terms and you get, so there's two to the D terms in, in total. And but you've already divided by two here. So there's a remaining D to divide by in front. In any case, this quantity looks like what? Well, cosine of theta i is asymptotic to one minus theta i squared over two when theta is close to zero. Uh, and we've added up d of these, so, and then divided by d. So we get a one, and then we get one over d, and then we get the sum of the theta i squared. So let me say r squared is the sum of the theta i squared. So we get one minus one over d times one minus r squared over two plus higher order terms. Sorry, this should be, I put the one in the wrong place. This is asymptotic to one minus r squared, uh, one r squared over two d plus higher order terms. So in any case, when we raise this to the nth power, we have the same kind of Gaussian discussion that we had before. So what this looks like is approximately a Gaussian with standard deviation equal to uh, one over the square root of n. Uh, symmetric in the R variable. And so the picture is that near the origin of the torus, we have a bump and the size of this bump is like one over the square root of n. But our torus is d dimensional. So the, the integral of this function is roughly the, the, is comparable to the volume of a ball of radius one over the square root of n. So this integral is comparable to the volume in our n of a ball around the origin of radius one over square root of n, and that's comparable to one over n to the d over two. So that's where the solution comes from uh, in general. Okay, so we'll revisit the higher dimensional random walks in terms of binomial coefficients next time. And um, then we'll go on to the discussion of harmonic functions on a lattice and how that relates to uh, random walks, which is really the main goal of the discussion. Okay.